Okay guys, welcome back. So again, we're straight into it, no messing around. We're on to video two, so this is Lawrence part I, I, part two. So again, in the first one, we've had a look at our overview, uh, very much an introduction to Lawrence, our wartime poet. It's interesting, I keep saying that he's a wartime poet, his poetry does not look at, you're not looking at like a Siegfried Sassoon or a Wilfred Owen, which a lot of us will remember from Junior Cert. Wartime poet in the sense that he's in, he's living in and around World War One, and then ultimately he travels extensively as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we're talking about his, I suppose, life and death and creativity. But second class on Lawrence, had a brief overview. We understand a little bit about the man, go back to the notes, as we said, the start of the notes on Lawrence, very informative in terms of style, poetic voice, uh, po poetic voice rather, sorry and look at our little bit of our biography right at the end as well, okay? We also started off with Intimates, and again, a fantastic, very humorous, uh, again, very much pointing a, a magnifying glass on society and ultimately how we behave when we're outside versus how we behave behind closed doors. You never know what's going on behind closed doors, and Intimates, perfect example of that, all right? We're gonna launch into our second poem, something you'll hear me talk about over the course of these videos, something my day school students will be sick to death of hearing about, is linking our poems together. Now, why do we do that? Well, we're trying to do that to show the examiners that we have this holistic appreciation of poetry and that we can respond in a very, very similar fashion, all right? It's a lot easier to say, well, clearly Lawrence likes to talk about life and death, when you can deal with two poems and you can see how he highlights that within both. Clearly Lawrence likes to point a bit of a cynical eye on society because not only does he deal with it in intimates, but clearly in Trading Clouds or Baby Movements 2, Trading Clouds, uh, we can see that there as well. All right, so for those of us with the notes in front of us, again, we're gonna to jump to page 39 of the notes and we're gonna look at our second poem. You can see intimates done. That's always a nice thing that we do on the board here. We just get rid of the material we've already covered. Moving on to Trailing Clouds, we'll have a little look at a poem very much about parenthood. So, relationships, part of society, how we behave, and Trailing Clouds, guys, if we are just jotting down one or two little pointers to give us a context, to give us an understanding before we look at the poem, this poem very much about parenthood, all right? Lawrence, not, not a parent in the traditional sense himself. Uh, Lawrence did marry, he married an individual who had three children herself, and obviously, then he becomes a parent, but in the sense of biological parent, not a parent himself, okay? So, well, it's interesting when you bring that little bit of context in, in terms of his poetic voice within this, okay? Then we go back to the element of humor a little bit and the juxtaposition between when you get baby movements as a title, trailing clouds, even though clouds, pathetic fallacy, we might talk about it being negative. If you don't know what pathetic fallacy is, guys, leaving certain level, we probably should know it, but it's again when the weather reflects the mood. In this sense here, it's all quite a nice introductory title, okay? And we take that down as one of our reference points. Again, it's gonna be another way that we can juxtapose title and content, so stylistically speaking, very similar to Intimates, okay? If you don't have the notes in front of you, as discussed, consult your poetry book, and then again, if you want to take two to three seconds at this rate, again, how fast you guys can Google stuff, have a little look, Trailing Clouds by D.H. Lawrence, and it'll come up on the screen in two seconds. So you can almost have me on one side, and then the poem on the other, which might work nicely. You can even minimize my screen and just listen to me again if you don't want to look at the screen. That might work even better. Anyway, let's have a look. So now that we have the poem in front of us on page 39, just a side note and something that we'd go through with our day school students the entire time and the grind students, we should pause. And again, if you're looking at this poem at first, uh, for the first time ever, treat it as an unseen, all right? I don't wanna get bogged down in unseen material too much now, but remind yourself, you have four to five minutes to take on your unseen poem, all right? Any new poetry, be it unseen or studied, treat it as such, treat it as unseen. Give yourself three or four minutes to dissect the poem. When we're dissecting the poem, guys, start, look, uh, techniques-wise. What are we finding in terms of style? What techniques are being used? Imagery, for example, similes, metaphors, etc. And ultimately then, how does that style reveal the subject matter and re reveal what we're talking about, okay? So I would encourage anybody watching at home now, pause the video, take, take two or three minutes, have an initial look, do your best, put pen to paper, try and underline, try and highlight what you think is significant in the poem. Because ultimately, guys, remember this, 
That, that's all that matters. What you think is significant in the poem, as long as the material you elect to learn, eight to 10 reference points, is malleable, is interchangeable for any sort of type of question, well then it doesn't matter what you elect to take on board, all right? So we pause, pause the video there guys, take a couple of minutes, read Trailing Clouds, and then we'll come back in two seconds. Welcome back. We'll have a little look now. So in terms of our title straight away, we highlight our title, Trailing Clouds. Again, we look at the movement, all right? The, the, I suppose, the laborious, the very much the slow movement, trailing clouds, okay? Trailing itself because of that ING noise at the end, again, gives that sense of lethargy, that sense of slowness. And that's exactly what we're getting within this poem. Now, as I said, don't get confused. When you get baby movements as a, as a title and you get the content, there is a clear juxtaposition here because the content is very much less than positive, okay? But the trailing clouds reveals a little bit to us. So we have a little concept. Even if you can't see that and you're sitting at home and you think, man, that's absolute bullshit, what I would say is, again, it's a nice little angle to take. It's a nice little one-liner to use. Let's look at the poem itself. I'll read all the way through it. I'll try my best not to stop like I did in the last one. I'll read all the way through it first and then we'll go back over it. As a drenched ground bee hangs numb and heavy from a bending flower, so clings to me my baby, her brown hair brushed with wet tears and laid against her cheek, her soft white legs hanging heavily over my arm, swinging heavily to my movement as I walk. My sleeping baby hangs upon my life like a burden, she hangs on me. She has always seemed so light, but now she is wet with tears and numb with pain. Even her floating hair sinks heavily, reaching downwards, as the wings of a drenched, drowned bee are a heaviness and a weariness. Okay? So I would argue, Lawrence, very accessible poet. There's a lot of things that you can pick up on straight away from his work. A lot of really easy conversational languages being used. Now, what I would say is, if you read a poem and you get a good strong sense of the poet's voice, well then we talk about the poem being quite confessional, you talk about being maybe a narrative of their life, or right? maybe a vignette of their life. If you get a poem where the poet is electing to use a different speaker, a different voice, well then we use the term poetic persona. All right, we remind ourselves of that and we use it for this poem here, okay? Lawrence is not writing this poem as himself, as discussed, not apparent to any newborn. In fact, that little bit of context that we spoke about, Lawrence only stepped in with his wife's children when they were adults. They only had a proper relationship when they were adults, okay? So we very much got poetic persona. Lawrence, for a period of time, also an English teacher, so there's that affinity there. And effectively, he was staying with individuals in Croydon, and that's their individual baby there. This is an individual called Hilda May, all right? So that's the, that's the baby in question here. So it's written from the voice of the mother, and that's what we're getting within this poem here, okay? Let's look at the language before we get into it a little bit in greater detail. As you can see, though, pointing that critical eye at social commentary, how are we expected to behave, as I said, as an individual who is pretty recently a, a new parent in terms of within the last 18 to 19 months. Again, you are expected to behave in a particular way, you're expected to talk about being a parent, having a child in a particular way, and what Lawrence does, he inverts that. He inverts the status quo, and what he gives us here is a lethargic, a pretty washed out, look at the wet, drowned, language that's being used, washed out, very, very tired speaker, okay? And as I said, I can relate, okay? As a drenched, drowned bee, we begin with a very, very interesting naturalistic simile, as, like, as, or than, as a drenched, drowned bee, we get a good, strong sense of alliteration there, drenched, drowned bee, the drowned, as I said, pretty negative language as well when we consider the connotations, but also the wet, the, the overbearing idea of like, once you're walking around dry clothes, the idea here, fine, light, but when those are clothes are wet, your hair is wet, there's a weightiness to it, and that's exactly what we're experiencing here. So this drowned bee hangs numb and heavy from a bending flower, so very naturalistic imagery there, the bending flower, bending again, almost close to breaking, again, the mother figure here, this is the speaker, bending, really struggling under the weight of it. So clings to me my baby, 
enjambment there. We go from that naturalistic imagery straight into the baby, actual image of the baby, and the understanding of what this poem is about. Her brown hair brushed, brown hair brushed, alliteration there again, with wet tears and laid against her cheek, her soft white legs hanging heavily over my arm. Now, there's an element of emotion here from the child, that the child is crying and it makes it significantly harder to parent. It's significantly harder than, uh, again, when you are experiencing the pain of the, of the child, of your child, it adds to the weightiness of the subject matter here, okay? Her soft white legs, very tactile, very vi visual. We go back to our sensuous tactile. You can feel the element there, you can see the child. Her soft white legs, hanging heavily over my arm, or alliteration yet again, swinging heavily to my movement as I walk. Now, there's the repetition of heavily, which cannot be ignored there, okay? Repetition falls under, again, our concept of pattern. Anytime there's repetition given, it, it helps frame the poem. That heavily used over and over again there talks about the weighty subject matter, but also the weighty feel of the poem as well. Swinging heavily to the movement, as I walk, again, that concept. Again, it's very visual, it's very tactile, okay? My sleeping baby hangs upon my life like a burden. Now, hanging upon my life is almost a double entendre there. There's two meanings we can take from that. Obviously, the fact that the baby is hanging on to her, but also that her life depends on the mother figure, which is absolutely true. Like a burden, guys, is very worrying. This is our red flag simile there, like a burden. To say that your child is a burden, again, as I said, is very worrying, and again, is very much the minority of cases. So that's very much revealing there. She hangs on me. She has always seemed so light, tactile, but now she is wet with tears and numb with pain. Okay, so the wet with tears going back to this concept, this repetition of this feeling, the, 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 the weight of the wetness and linking it with the numb with pain. It's very upsetting to read. Even her floating hair sinks heavily, reaching downwards. Now, as I've said before, guys, last two to four lines of every poem become the most significant. As the wings of a drenched, drowned bee, we get lineation. If you haven't come across lineation before, it's when a poet uses one line, repeats that one line, again, for emphasis. We also get what's called anaphora, which is when something is mentioned at the start and periodically returned to as well. Very, very significant simile then within this. It's gonna be one of our eight to 10 reference points that you take from this poem. As the wings of a drenched, drowned bee are a heaviness and a weariness. Now, tone, mood, almost thematic, all represented by the terms heaviness, weariness. What you get there is consonance. I don't know if a lot of us at home have heard this technique before, but consonance is the endings of terms and the endings that again is used to kind of highlight how the poet is feeling. Heaviness and weariness totally sums up the mood and the tone of this uh, piece as well, which is very, very odd. It's not always that you get that tone and mood being linked by the language that's being used, all right? Heaviness and weariness, we go back to constantly when we're talking about this poem, okay? Thematically speaking, repeating myself slightly now, societal expectations, what is a parent expected to do, okay? How are they expected to behave versus ultimately what we get in trailing clouds here, okay? There is that, it's much more of a kind of a, a darkly humorous angle, okay? The drenched brown bee, it's almost a, a funny image, and then coupled with the rest of the material, it gets a little bit more significant, a little bit more weighty, just to use the terminology again. And then we talk about that juxtaposition in terms of what do we expect from a poem that starts with baby movements versus what we read uh, itself, okay? So that's our theme, tone, and hopefully the techniques there. As I said, one of the benefits of what we're doing here is that you can pause and rewind the video, take on board some of the little one-liners we've discussed, really cement them and start to amalgamate them then within your actual answer itself. On page 40 of the notes, if we have the notes at home guys, if you have a little look, we get a little bit of context about, as I said, about Lawrence being that teacher figure in, 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 in England at that time. But the speaking voice in the poem is not Lawrence, poetic persona, but rather a parent, possibly the parent, as we said, of the child uh, within question. While the poem explores the relationship between the parent and child, it also focuses on the demands, both physical and emotional, as being a parent. 
And that, that's what we said about the numbness and the pain and how empathetic or sympathetic we need to be towards our speaker. Okay? And the poem itself is also categorized by naturalistic imagery. So we've got a very, very, what I would say is universal poem, despite its clear uh, topic and its clear thematic angle, the concept of relationships, parent, parenthood, societal expectations. We have a very, very useful poem there if a naturalistic angle came up on our question as well. And we could potentially use that. For, for a number of different questions, okay? Again, guys, I'll, I'll direct you to the notes as well. So for those of us with the notes at home, pattern, imagery, sensuousness, and suggestiveness, what I would encourage you to do is have a little pause, look at the poem yourself, jot down the couple of pointers that you have there, then maybe go back, listen to the video, go back and take a second look at it as well, okay? So that is Trailing Clouds, guys. That's our second poem that we're very much going to look at and we're going to link together with... Um, with intimates at the beginning of this uh, this answer. Now, something I will say about structure, and as I said, one of the one of the videos today on structure will be uh, or will be on structure essay structure. For example, there are ways and means to go about starting an answer. Uh, mosquito and snake. I would encourage potentially not to start with those because I think a lot of the people out in the country will probably go with those two more of the easier, more of the accessible ones. I think that might be a nice way, a nice angle to start. Obviously, it's question dependent. We'll look at the question, as I said, in our fourth video today. But nonetheless, it might be a potential way to start our answer. Okay? So, guys, that's trailing clouds. What I would encourage you to look at now is our third uh, of our six poems that we're going to look at, which is a poem called Piano, which is on page 13 of the notes. So I'd encourage us to, to jump to that there now. As discussed, if you don't have the notes in front of you, it's a, it's a quick Google or it's a quick kind of reference point within your actual um, poetry notes yourself, okay? So piano, guys, if we have a look, Trailing Clouds, always a nice thing to do, very satisfying that you can cross off a poem in terms of um, talking when the fact that we've no one in the room here, but typically if I was had a full room, I'd probably get the exact same response to some of my terrible jokes, but that's always a nice little thing to do in terms of crossing it off and, and, a, and a completion element there. We're now looking at piano, so in terms of areas of focus that we've spoken about, we're on to a separate area of focus now, okay? We've left societal expectations, social commentary, this kind of element behind parenthood relationships, and we're now moving on to a very, very pointed, uh, a very personal element within Lawrence's poetry, and that's exactly what you need to say, okay? Again, as I said, because this, or both rather, of these poems are incredibly emotional, they're incredibly emotionally honest, you have to have empathy and you have to have sympathy towards the speaker. Now, whether you do or you don't, that's what we're looking for in terms of correctors, in terms of examiners, in terms of teachers, we're looking for you guys to show that empathy, to show that sympathy, okay? Piano, guys, as you can see here, we're starting with more of a positive note. Very much to do with the relationship between himself and his mother. Uh, the mother figure was the individual who basically put him onto books, put him onto literature, and they had that affinity between them, okay? So there's clearly a, a reason why Lawrence talks a hell of a lot about his mother and less so about his father. As I said, Lawrence, very sick, ailing child, um, wouldn't have been the, the biggest, the strongest individual, had to spend a lot of time at home. His brother dies young as well. Lawrence clearly dies very, very young. So the mother basically was the one who he, he was at home with, the father out working in the mines. She was at home, they were engaging with that literature together. Now again, if you're sitting there going, yeah, Kowser, I don't care about Lawrence's whole family tree and about his whole background. It's just a little bit of context that you can use to frame some of the poems. Why do we get such a nostalgic, such an emotional poem in, in piano? It's because of that affinity, because of that relationship he had with his mother. All right? So, as I said, he, she dies when he's 25. And what we get is, going back to some of the terminology guys on the board, we get this sense of nostalgia, okay? So what we'll do is, We'll, we'll launch into it here. If we don't get it done, we'll continue it on in our, in our, next, uh, our next video as well, okay? Straight off the bat, in terms of our poem itself, as discussed, the things that we should be doing, you highlight our title. Nice little thing about piano is that it's an actual tangible object, okay? Now ask yourself, when you read that, the poem you're about to launch into, do you get a very descriptive poem about the actual subject matter in the title? 
or is it far more abstract? Is it far more open-ended? In this poem here, the piano serves as a vector, serves as a, a medium with which the rest of us reading the poem can actually look at the nostalgic element, look at effectively what Lawrence is trying to put across to us, which is this vignette, which is this nostalgic moment, okay? I will pause as discussed. You can see in terms of the poem itself, we all have it in front of us, pattern-wise, three stanzas, it looks like a poem, so we call this a conventional poem, all right? It looks very, very conventional. The content is also conventional, okay? It tends to be, it's, as I said, it's a nostalgic moment, but it's very easily digestible, it's very easily understood as well, okay? So, we're gonna take that pause, we're gonna have those three minutes, read the poem yourself, try and gain an understanding about those kind of things that we're talking about, and then what we'll do is we'll come back. We'll come back, guys, in our third video. We'll start with piano having after you guys have had that pause. All right? See you in two minutes.